So good morning. Uh, thank you for coming to the BMA. Uh, so as, as chapter president uh, of the BMA Carolinas, thank you for coming, period. And also thank you for coming to this presentation. Um, it's, a, it's a video presentation. Just making sure you know that's why you're here, right? But also, so in, in light of that, uh, let's, let's show you a video. Now, it's, it's a joke, right? This is a joke video. So laughing is OK. We're all familiar with that, laughing. Um, and, uh, and it's certainly not intended to be uh, offensive in any way. Um, so let's, let's watch the video uh, really quick, and then we'll get started. I, so, yeah, so it's made with all stock footage, right? And, and the point of that, obviously, is that, I mean, it's funny, right? And it's funny because it's true. Because every time you turn around, that's what you see. Every corporate video looks something like this. Fair? So at the end, by the end of this, hopefully, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll be inspired to never do anything like that. Uh, so for those of you that don't know, uh, my name is Frank Schwartz. You are in the right place. Uh, it's Kevin Carlisle's uh, golf clinic is next week. I don't know why I always tell that joke. It's a terrible joke. It's a terrible joke. Um, I'm, the, I'm the CEO of LEC Media. We are a, uh, a video marketing and production firm here in Charlotte. And um, my life is uh, super glamorous. We help large corporate clients uh, with their video strategy. Um, and uh, I get to do amazing, awesome things like this. I don't know if you can tell, but this is me on set holding stuff. <laughs> Like, that's, uh, that's my job. They're like, you can't touch many things, but here, could you like just be a stand for a minute? That's, that's my job. And I pay Allison. That's the other thing that I do. Um, the other part of my life uh, is these people. This is my wife uh, and my three daughters. Um, this part is also super glamorous because I get to do things like play dress up and have my nails painted and play Barbies and stuff like that. Um, they're nine, uh, I mean, 11, nine, and five now, and they take a lot of time, um, but, uh, but they're pretty fantastic. And so that's my glamorous life outside of video, but for the next few minutes, we're gonna talk about video. Um, so I, I feel important, it's important to tell you that I, by education, I'm a psychologist. For those of you who don't know, that's Sigmund Freud. 
Um, but uh, I did undergraduate work and graduate work in psychology. Um, that is what I wanted to do until I got into psychology and worked in mental health for about a year and a half and was like, those people are fucking crazy. <laughs> so I was like, I got to get out of here. Um, but the, the important thing about that is that it has shaped a lot of how I view the world and certainly how I view uh, marketing and how I view what I do uh, on a daily basis uh, with video. And so uh, that's the only reason I have to think it's somewhat relevant. Plus, it's a funny story to tell, but that's okay. So what we're going to talk about is how video drives behavior today. Uh, so this, this presentation could also be called getting people to do stuff using video, right? Making people do things. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about how it drives behavior, why it works, and then hopefully a couple of uh, takeaways uh, in there that may be useful to you. I know that that's why most of you came was for the, like, those nugget takeaways. So feel free to eat your breakfast and get on your phone. And then if you just ask the person next to you to like, nudge you in 20 minutes, then you can get the takeaways. There's a lot of research, uh, both empirical, uh, anecdotal, a lot of different things that indicate that video is good. Video good. Remember that for the whole thing, right? And there's a lot of reasons why that is. Um, Google talks about things like uh, micro moments, if you're familiar with that term, like these, these small decisions that people make all along the way and how video helps uh, to, to flip people you know, and, and their decision making. They talk a lot about millennials. Um, we're going to hear a lot more about Google and, and analytics and, and smart things uh, here in a minute from Vents. But, um, but uh, I don't know if you know this, the people, well, half this room. And actually, if you look at it, it looks like we've got millennials over here. And, well, minus one. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, no, just kidding. Oh, that's right. That's right. Double, double millennial. No, but, uh, but, the, but those are the decision makers of... Uh, of, of our next few years, right? So the people that are making decisions in large corporate entities, a lot of you indicated that you're service providers and things like that. Millennials are the people that are making those decisions. And in case you didn't know, today's your day. Here's your factoid takeaway. Uh, those people adore uh, online video. They love it. Um, they, they live by it. Uh, they, that is how they consume information from the internet now. They're not reading it. They're not looking at your pictures and brochures and things like that. You have to have those things, certainly. But uh, they, that is not how they're consuming the internet. How they're consuming the internet and how they're consuming information is, uh, is through video. Uh, and so it's, it's an, an important, again, never mind all that. Just remember this, video good. So the question I typically ask at this point is, so what business are you in? And, and I just I like to get a couple answers. So if you have just somebody, yes, blue shirt. You didn't raise your hand. You have no interest in answering this question. But what business are you in? Uh, corporate marketing, and we're uh, how to do water treatment equipment. Okay, water treatment equipment. Utility industry. Utility industry. Anybody else? What business are you in? Printing. Okay, printing, direct mail. Oh, food. That's right. That's right. So all those answers are sort of correct. They're mostly correct, and I don't want to hurt your feelings at all. So don't be offended by what I'm about to say. But you're wrong. You, whether you like it or not, are in the people business. And I know it's a cliche, I know it's cheesy to say it, but friends and neighbors, this is the fact, right? We are in the human being business. You're not in, was it, what was it again? Water. water I was gonna say waste treatment, but I, didn't want, I knew that was wrong. So you're not in the water treatment business, you're in the business of helping people get their water treated, fair? And the only reason I make that distinction is because it's a very important mind shift and I think this is what is partly what's wrong with a lot of our marketing now anyway, is we like to talk about what we do and how we do it. We adore that. We love long lists of features and benefits. We think that's just the best. And that's part of what we've done as marketers for a long time, right? We make some pretty brochures and we talk about, you know, how much water do you treat in a day? Is that important? Yes. It, it, okay, I mean, like when you're going and selling to somebody else, so they go, man, Four million gallons, that's not bad, right? I mean, I don't know, right? But the problem is, is that doesn't translate to anything in my brain that I can really latch onto and say, but what does that mean for me? What does that do for me? So again, I love you, don't feel bad, but, um, but that's, that's the deal. We are in the people business first. And so for a long time, we've talked a lot about, uh, you've, you've heard things like sales funnel. You're, you're familiar with that one, right? So you start with a thing and you narrow it down a few more and you narrow it down, you know, right? And, and there's a lot of models that have been drawn over time, and there's a guy, and let me see if I've got his name written down here, Andrew Davis. Um, 
Uh, in fact, if you went to the, the BMA Nationals Conference at all, you, you heard Andrew. It was fantastic, right? And he talked about this whole idea of a customer journey or a consumer journey, a client journey, whatever you want to. It's, it's a journey, not a funnel. And he talked about all the different ways that we've drawn the funnel over time and all the different things that we've tried to you know, shove people into. But it really looks more like a journey now. Uh, so I encourage you, write that one down. That's, that's important. It's hilarious. Andrew Davis, BMA 2015 conference. That's, that's one that's worth watching. But the fact is it's a different world, right? Now, this is a joke not for millennials because they have no idea what that is. But raise your hand if you do, right? Thank you. Oh, all right, Lisa, of course Lisa Smith knows. She's the, the queen of pop culture. But, um, uh, but the world has changed. And so because it's a, a different world and because people are looking at you in a different way than they ever have before, the, the fact of the matter is it used to be okay to sort of start with a large number of people and broadcast your message out and then sort of look around the room and go, okay, you people aren't interested and you people are, so great. Let's, let me just talk to these people over here. And you could drive that message a lot more in that way. You could tell them what you wanted to tell them. But unfortunately, since it's a different world, that's not how it works anymore. You know that, I, I want to say, maybe I wrote it down here. Is it 82, 82, 85? Anyway, it's in the high 80s. 80 something percent of people have already, they've researched you and have made some degree of decision about whether or not they're going to use your product or service long before they ever contact you. They already know what they feel like they want to know about you before they call, before they fill out your form, period. And so it, it, McKinsey and company came up with this. Um, it's a model that looks a little bit more like a, an egg, maybe, a track. It's a journey. It's not a funnel, right? So you start over here, and there's some sort of trigger that gets you started. And that trigger could be any number of things, right? could be, uh, and we'll, well, we'll go over an example in a minute, but some, something triggers you to know that you want to investigate further. So you develop sort of this initial consideration set of, of people, uh, of choices of, of things that you may look at, right? And so uh, they might be a, well, we'll go over the, 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 uh, the example in a second. But So you, you, you get to this initial consideration set. There's a, an initial set of brands or, or companies that they want to look at. And then they start to look on the internet. And so they go to this active evaluation stage, right? And so they start adding and subtracting other brands that may be useful, right? So if they're looking for printing services from our wonderful sponsor, Boingo Graphics, give me a hand, right? Thank you. Thank you. you don't, have to, don't have to actually do that, that was a joke. Um, but, uh, you know, they might look at any number of other companies that do the same kind of thing, and they might take Boingo out for a minute, and they go, oh, wait, but he does this, so let's put him back in. So there's this very active evaluation going on. Right? And they'll add and subtract a lot of information, sort of make this, this list of things. OK, here's the people we know that we want to contact. Here's the people we want to actually get in touch with. We think they'll serve our needs. We like who they are. Uh, we feel like they may be a trusted brand. We're not really sure, but we think they're OK. And then they'll go to contacting you and getting more information from you and, and those kinds of things. Right? And then somewhere over here, they actually buy something. Thank goodness. Um, but they finally buy something. And then you have this sort of this post-purchase experience, right? So you've got to stay in touch with them somehow. How many do, do like email marketing, newsletters, anybody do that kind of stuff? Familiar, right? And, and that's where you sort of keep them interested and keep them on the hook and maybe sell them something else later. And then eventually they're going to have another, uh, you know, something else that comes up. And if you've done the right job in here, then they'll, they'll enter sort of your loyalty loop and keep buying from you. That's the hope. Right? So you've got to do a lot of good job you know, with sort of the customer service and things after the fact. But that's the feeling is now this is much more uh, representative of how a customer buys versus the old way, which was, well, I guess I'll just stand here until somebody tells me something. You know, or they have a need, and, but they, they didn't have anywhere near the amount of information uh, that they could go get. Right Now, I mean, we know everything about you uh, before we call you. So, that, so think of that McKinsey and Company. That's another one, write that down. You know, McKinsey and Company, look that up. There's, there's some really valuable information there. Again, that Andrew Davis talk is very helpful with that. So let me give you an example. It's 11.30 on a Friday, right? And in our office, that trigger, remember we talked about the trigger, right? So the trigger may be hunger. Because 11.30 on Friday means it's company lunch day, right? We all go to lunch together, typically, unless we're out shooting or doing something else. And this is exactly what our company lunches look like. Uh, I'm, I'm usually the Asian guy, but every once in a while I get to be the guy with my hands up. Right? Um, 
no, of course, that's ridiculous. But we, um, we go to company lunch, and it's a bonding thing for us. It's a, you know, it's time that we spend together. But the problem is, is the trigger of hunger leads to an initial consideration set of, well, any number of factors, right? Could be what's nearby, uh, what's in our price range, what, um, any number of things that we want to think about, right? So a lot of choices can end up in that initial consideration set. It could be uh, Chinese food, Mexican food, could be whatever, right, burgers. So then we begin that active evaluation, which means that we go to Google. And we go, Google, where should I? And honestly, this is the truth, I typed, where should I? And this is what, like, before I even got to eat, that's what was coming up, right? So clearly everyone goes to Google to know what to eat so that then they can take pictures with their camera and then post it on Instagram. It's a very wonderful loop. Um, so you ask Google, where should I eat? And then you might go to Yelp or you might go to Urban Spoon or any number of those other sites, right? And you start actively evaluating, okay, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna do this? Um, because what we wanna know is, what, what are we having for lunch? We still got that trigger, we still have that need um, that's, that's burning in us, right? So then we go through it, you know, we had that initial consideration set, maybe we've added a few restaurants, thrown a few away, maybe we've narrowed it down that we want Chinese food, but there's still five Chinese restaurants nearby, so what are we gonna do, how are we gonna get to those, and we continue this active evaluation. Honestly, this turned into such a pain in the ass for us that we decided the best way to do it was we assigned restaurants randomly to bingo balls, and then we roll. <laughs> It's true, you can go to our Facebook page and watch the video, but that's how we decide where to go to lunch on Friday now. Because the other, it was just a pain. It just got to be a real hassle. Because there was nothing really helping us differentiate one choice from another choice as we went through that customer journey. Does that make sense? Okay. So, unfortunately, your clients, the people that you're trying to, to sell to or to market to, may be making decisions in a very similar way. If there's not something in there that helps them break that pattern, that helps them understand that there's a different, uh, or a difference between you and a competitor, they, they may too go to the bingo, uh, the bingo cage, which would be a terrible way um, to do that. And so we have to present our message as companies, as marketers, right? We have to present our message in a slightly different way so that it will actually drive behavior instead of just getting caught in the, the noise of all the other choices. So it has to change, right? Um, so if we, if we construct our message properly at every stage of that process, right, of that customer journey, then we have a chance, I think, of, uh, of tipping the scales in our direction. So here's the other part of why me being a psychology person was important. Because it's all biological, right? There's nothing, it's not nothing, all right? That's an over-exaggeration. But a lot of it is biological. So our brains are broken up into different areas, right? And the, and the parts that do the decision making, the actual decision making, are different from the parts that do the rational thinking, okay? And so, <clears throat> excuse me. So our limbic brain, oh sorry, I'm in your way. Our limbic brain, this part in here, is in charge of things like emotion, right? Feelings. It's also, it controls kind of our fight or flight response, right? So those primal, that's, that's our old brain. Now, I'm not here to tell you how your brain got to be the way it is. Whether you believe it was created that way or whether you believe it evolved that way, I don't actually care. The fact is, is this is the way it is now, so that's what we're gonna talk about. This is, this is a primal brain, this is old stuff, this is way down deep, stuff that keeps you safe, keeps you alive, makes you know whether something's a good choice or a bad choice, right? If I say, well, you know, we won't do that, but this is how you know you're in love with someone, this is why you think they're hot, right? Does that make sense, <laughs> right? You go, okay, you can, you can empirically say attractive, well, maybe one day it was, I don't know. But no, I'm just kidding, right? Or, but, but when you know you're in love, it's somewhere in here. So because there's these different parts of our brain uh, and they're, they're controlled in these, these different areas, um, we have to present our message in such a way that reaches those, those parts of the brain better, right? Features and benefits, big long lists of why we say we're better than everyone else, crap like, and I don't mean this in a, a negative way, but you know, oh, been in business 75 years, doesn't matter. Lots of people can say that kind of stuff, right? But w when it matters is, that's, that's how they're gonna justify it if they already feel that there's something good about you. Okay, and so we wanna, that's what video does, right? We're gonna get them to the feel something good about you, and then they can justify it with all those facts and figures and features and benefits later. Dr. Donald Calm. 
He's a Canadian neurologist. The essential difference between emotion and reason is that emotion leads to action, while reason leads to conclusions. I'm going to say it again. The essential difference between emotion and reason is that emotion leads to action, while reason leads to conclusions. So why is that important to us? Well, because in that outer part of our brain, in that frontal cortex uh, area, that's where things like language, logical thought, all those kinds of things are, uh, are housed, right? So that's where we make our lists of features and benefits, just like we were talking about. This is, um, this is why, this is why you know you need a car, right? But this is why you drive a Ferrari, right? <laughs> Does that make sense? Okay. So, if you're, a, and I don't know, if, has anyone heard of Simon Sinek? Do you know that guy? Start with why. You've, so, some of this is probably, you've heard this kind of thing before. Turns out it's not, uh, it's not just a cool talk, but it's actually like the truth. So, that's good. Um, so, if you have, that's another one to write down. If you haven't heard that or seen that, it's the best 18 minutes of your life um, up to this point. Simon Sinek, start with why. Just go out on YouTube and look at that one. So the problem is, is we present our information to our clients or our prospective audience in that fashion, right? We start out here with a list of features and benefits, and then we hope that we'll drive them to actually make a decision. But unfortunately, we usually never get past there to actually making any kind of uh, meaningful decision. So we have to present our information in a different order. Because right now, we start and we say, and if you've heard the talk, right, you say, we, make fan we treat water better than anybody else in the whole wide world. We are the best at what we do. We've been in business for 400 years. We pump 75 million gallons every 32.3 seconds. We, you know, best filtration or whatever it is, right? All the things that everybody can say in some fashion or other, that's what we put out here. And then we hopefully drive it the other way. But if we presented it in the opposite direction and we said, everything we do, we believe that clean water makes life better. We believe that clean water, whatever, right? Doesn't matter. Fill in the blank with whatever the truth is. Inspires fear. Clean water inspires fear. No. What? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> you can go to the other. Yeah, you could. Yeah, you can inspire, or you could, or you can scare them. Exactly. It's, yeah, you could. You could take the Channel Nine News approach and be like, "Do you know what you're drinking?" <laughs> Film at eleven, right? So we have to present our, our information in, in the opposite order to inspire behavior. Otherwise, all we do is lead to a bunch of conclusions. Okay? So I think that the first thing you have to do is engender trust. That is the most important thing that you can do. You can justify it later, but you have to get to that emotional part of the brain and make people feel something, feel like they can trust you. And then you have a chance to tell them some of the other things that set you apart from your competitors. And unfortunately, that has become incredibly, incredibly difficult. And, and I'm going to show you why. This is, this is why. <laughs> if I can get it to play. Here we go. 1994, the year of putting a bit of a kick in the handle. Sales up by 8%. 1997, the year of putting some of the bristles in diagonally. Dirty. He's got a dirty tongue. Has he? Well, of course he hasn't. But you thought he might have. And when it's not me 
he's saying it, but a Scottish brunette in rectangular glasses and a lab coat. <laughs> They might actually brush their towels. Of course they will. Did you know that up to 68% of them suffer from dirty tongue? Over time, microscopic anti tungonoids build up a gritty deposit the surface, which might very well mean that people laugh at you behind your back and secretly find you repulsive. <laughs> the market of men too, Gus. Which might very well mean that that's why you're not getting enough sex. <laughs> so, what would put something on the back of the toothbrush? Could do. Doesn't matter. I mean, people aren't actually going to brush their tunnels. Trying to brush your tunnel makes you rich. Everybody knows that. But when they're buying the toothbrush, they'll forget it. They'll forget everything except the Scottish brunette telling them that's why they're not getting enough sex. They will. They will. They'll brush their goddamn tunnels. If we can get them to brush their tunnels, we can get them to do anything. <laughs> exactly. That's the problem. That's why nobody trusts you when you tell them facts and figures. Because they know that you sit in a little room with your little crony friends and tell them to brush their tongues. Fair? That's the problem. So aside from that, because people have felt lied to, and they think that that's our job, right, is to, is to make that horrible claim that you can brush your tongue. And, and Although, did you know that they did that, right? There was a thing, like the whole mouth brush. Did you see that? Never mind. The thing about video is you can't, well, I shouldn't say you can't. You can. You can hide anything you want. You can lie as much as you like. Because the cool part is, and this has always been one of my favorite things about video, is you only see this little teeny bit of whatever it is I want to show you, right? All the stuff that's happening outside the frame, doesn't matter. I can hide all of that. I would be embarrassed to tell you, uh, she's not in here, but we have clients, right? There, and their stuff doesn't work. And we have to show, right, that's the thing. You have to show that it works. It has to work the first time. And you have to tell that story. But it's not the truth. Video engages all of our senses, and that's why it's a great lying tool. Can we that part? Absolutely. Video is the best lying tool there is on the planet. I will stand by it all day, every day. But the converse is also true, that it's the best truth-telling tool on the planet, all day, every day. Data. What's that? Data. And data. <laughs> right? <clears throat> But you get the idea, right? There's a, it engages all the senses. There's a ton of research that says why it's good. Video, good. We got that part, right? But just like Nathan was saying, video, good. Truth, better. Fair? So the trick is, the main point of all of this, uh, in my opinion, is that we've come to a point in marketing where truth uh, is the most powerful tool that we have to inspire action. We have to be a lot more transparent. We have to be, I don't know who's getting roughed up next door. We have to be a lot more transparent. We have to be a lot more honest. And we have to tell the real story of our business, the real story of why we do what we do and who we are. Does anyone, and again, with all the love and respect that I can muster, does anyone really believe in their heart of hearts that every single person on the planet is a good person? consumer for what you do. No. It's stupid. No, like, so when you go around and you ask somebody, oh, what makes a good client for you? Well, anybody. Get out. Just, you're fired. Just leave. It's terrible. You want to do business with people that believe the same things you believe. Right? You want to do business with people that would be a good fit with your organization. Is that a fair statement? If someone really truly believes in their heart of hearts, Kevin, that the lowest price option is the only option you should go with. Do you want to do business with that guy? Hell no, right? You want that guy to go somewhere else. So it's about what that person believes. And so the only way to get to what that person believes is if you're telling the truth about who you are so that then they can understand and you want to get in that, that like-minded group, right? I only do business with certain kinds of people and the rest of those people I can't help. 
because they don't believe what I believe. No matter how many times I try to tell them, no matter how many ways I try to explain it to them, it isn't going to work because they don't believe it. They think it's a different way. It should be a different thing. And I can't help those people. So another one, uh, let's see if I wrote it down here. Velocity Partners. This is another one. Look up, look up Insane Honesty, Velocity Partners. Um, and we're, how long do we have? We have uh, 10 more minutes. 10 more minutes. Nice Great. Perfect. Thank you, Vince. Someone has to keep track of this stuff. And it obviously, it wasn't me. They talked about a, they needed a room uh, for an event, right? They needed a room in a, for an event at a restaurant. And they talked about the list of requirements that they had for that room. They had to have, you know, it had to be private, it had to be a vegetarian menu, blah, 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 blah. A whole bunch of different list of requirements. The restaurant did not have those things, but they told the person that was trying to buy up front, we don't have that stuff. But here's what we do have, and here's how we could accommodate your needs, even though we don't have all those things that you said you wanted. So look that one up. That's, that's worthwhile. She did it in a straightforward way, engendered trust. She said, hey, you may not like what we have. I don't know. But put it out there in a very transparent way and ended up buying from her rather than the other restaurants who were all like, everything's shiny and everything's perfect and you know, the world is, is yours. So what's your job as a marketer? I think your job as a marketer is to tell the truth. Your job as a marketer is to make weaknesses into strengths. The goal, like we said, isn't to do business with everybody, it's to do business with the people that, that believe what we believe. And so the, the single best way, and we were talking a little bit about engaging senses and things like that, in my opinion, this is my opinion. It's backed up in fact, so it's a pretty good opinion, <laughs> not gonna lie. Um, but the single best way to connect to that person and connect and be able to tell your story and to really be transparent is by showing them everything there is to see, is by not hiding it behind you know, the Scottish brunette and rectangle glasses, right? but it's to just tell the story as it is. So our job as marketers is to build trust by truth telling and not storytelling. So it's a simple idea, uh, but it's not the easiest idea in the world. We have a, a process that we use and we call it the Y times seven process. Now, that's bull crap. We don't actually, that's a lie. But it's fun to say because we believe that you should act like a toddler. That's what we think. We think at LEC Media, we believe that you should ask a person why at least seven times. Why they do what they do. Why they do what they do. You're going to say, uh, no, I don't mean like in an annoying way. You don't be like, why, 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 but why, why, mom, why? Right? Uh, don't, not like that, but, uh, but almost like that. But you have to ask why. You have to get past if you go back to the brain part, you have to get past that intellectual part of your brain into that emotional part of the part of your brain. And the only way to do that is by asking that question why a bunch of times. So let me give you a quick example and then I'll get out of your way. So this is a, I'm gonna show you a video here in a second. And I picked this example because it was something I thought everyone could relate to. Anybody never been to a swimming pool before? Okay, good. And anyone not familiar with the smell of a swimming pool? Like, you know when a hotel has a swimming pool, right? You walk in and you're like, well, apparently we have an indoor pool, right? Because you know that smell. Um, I chose this example again because I thought it was relevant to everyone. So there's a company that came to us saying, uh, we're not selling enough of our product. Um, I'm, I'm sure that's not a complaint you've ever heard. Does anyone ever come to you and say, hey, we're not selling enough of our product? Right? I mean, that's, that's why we market things, right? So they make these giant air cleaners um, for indoor pools. And why would anyone want one of those? Well... That was the first question we asked. What, well, why? Why, why, do you need to, why do you need to have these things? And they were like, well, because it smells in the pool area. Um, you see rust on the lifeguard chairs. There's mold or whatever it is, right? That's, that's why. OK, fine. So most marketers at that point go, all right, well, let's talk about all the, the things that we do to fix the smell and fix the air cleaner and fix all that, you know, fix the rust on the, the lifeguard chairs. And, and that's, that's our message. That's what we're going to go with. Unfortunately, everybody else who does what he does tells the exact same kind of story, right? So we want to get past that. So, okay, so, but why does it smell? I mean, truthfully, that smell is almost nostalgic, right? I mean, you almost get a little like, oh, I remember when we went to hotels as a kid. And, you know, like, so there's, is the smell really that big of a deal? Why is the smell a problem? And so we, we keep going. They aren't to the truth yet. So we keep asking questions. Well, why does it smell? Why does it do this? Why does it do that? And then he started telling me about the the poison 
that is created from the organic things that happen in the water. <coughs> you know what I'm talking about. Um, and how it reacts with the, the cleansing stuff that they put in there and what that off, the, the gases that come off of that and how breathing those gases are really, really hazardous for you and actually can cause a lot of problems. And we're like, well, shit. My, my mind goes to my three girls and going to the, the pool. Suddenly now I'm emotionally involved because I asked past the first why. Well, why do you want an air cleaner? Well, you know, I gotta get rid of the smell. Okay, and then we just start telling a story. If we can go in a few more levels, right? Now suddenly it's personal. Now I want an air cleaner. Um, you know, I, it, it's important to me. People are getting sick and I think of my girls and that's, that's the important thing. So remember this quote, the essential difference between emotion and reason is that emotion leads to action while reason leads to conclusions. So what we wanted to do, and the example that I'm gonna actually, I'm, I'm gonna show just a little piece of it just to give you an idea, but um, what, what we wanted to do was connect with that, here's the emotional reason why you actually need this giant air pool or pool air cleaner thing uh, versus just the, the normal intellectual reasons. Would you ride around in a car with no exhaust system? Of course not. Fumes from the engine would enter the car, right? So why would you swim in an indoor pool without an effective exhaust system? Oh, you didn't know that the air hanging around a typical indoor pool is toxic? Well, check this out. Pools are kept clean by introducing chlorine into the water. The chlorine attacks organics in the water, stuff like body oils, hair, dirt, and other things we probably shouldn't mention here. Chlorine wages a war against organics and wins. Yay, chlorine. But this war is not fought without a price. That pool smell isn't the chlorine itself. It's the chemical byproducts of chlorine doing its job. Remember when your mom warned against mixing bleach and ammonia? Well, in this equation, the chlorine is the bleach and the organics are the ammonia. According to the World Health Organization, here's just some of the dangerous byproducts that off-gas from the swimming pool. Gases such as trichloramine, chloroform, cyanogen chloride, and trichloronitromethane. Seriously nasty stuff. Pause the video and Google it. We'll wait. Yeah, we know. Bad news. What's worse, cyanogen chloride, when mixed with water vapor, becomes hydrogen cyanide. So, chloramines are nasty. They're heavier than oxygen, and they build up over time. Gone unchecked, they create a hazardous cloud of toxins that hovers over the water. Anyone in the water is breathing this chemical cloud instead of clean, fresh air. Look, you're using basic chemistry to clean the water in the pool. And basic chemistry is contaminating the air around the pool. You're treating the water. Shouldn't you treat the air around it? This is real. And the way we see it, you have two choices. Ignore the problem or address it. If you choose the latter, there is a solution. That's where we come in. Panic evacuators. Give us a call today at 8 And blah, blah, blah. You get the idea. Right? But that was the point, is instead of saying, oh, we clean air, nobody cares, we say, you're going to die. <laughs> now I'm emotionally involved. And that's the whole point, is you can't do that effectively in the same way uh, by telling the story the way that you've always told the story, and you can't do it by just writing it down, unfortunately. So I, I hate, I'm sorry for all the copywriters in the room, but that's the way it is. Um, so the point of this all again is that we're in the people business. We have to market to people. Uh, we can't market near them. We can't market around them. We have to market to them. Uh, and those are, are the people that, that we want to well, I shouldn't say that. If the robots take over, nobody's laughing. Okay, that's fine. If the zombie apocalypse happens, right, and then there aren't people anymore, then you can do it a different way. But until then, we have to market to people. The human beings that you want to buy your product or service are the human beings you have to connect with on that emotional level in order to get them to drive their behavior toward what it is you want them to do. So with that, are there any questions? It was perfectly comprehensive. In what way? The styles or what's sort of the tactics of this? Do they change? How fast do they change? And what, where, has, where has it come in the last two or three years? As far as kind of execution, things yeah, like that? Sort of what, what works in the Or even delivery. You know, like yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah, no, tons of that kind of stuff. What and you, works now that didn't three years ago? Uh, 
so obviously we know a few things, right? So here's, oh, see, I should have just started with this. Here's the takeaways, right? Shorter is better. We know that, right? Uh, we know that uh, depending on where they are in that customer journey that we were talking about, um, you, can, you can present different kinds of messages in different kinds of ways. It's going to be somewhat specific to your industry probably, but for the most part, um, shorter is better as a general rule. Uh, delivery has become ridiculous. Uh, you can get it. I mean, obviously, you can consume that information in any number of ways. There's all kinds of social channels and all kinds of other uh, search and, and video sites that you can go to. I mean, you probably know this already, but YouTube is the number two video search engine in the, or search engine period in the whole wide world, right? Um, after Google, Google number one, YouTube number two. Is there such a, does anyone go to Yahoo anymore? Is that a thing? Anyone, there's a thing called Bing. You maybe have heard of it. It's great, but um, yeah, I mean, those are the, those are the big ones. So. Um, Google, and I don't know if Vince will talk about this at all, but uh, Google gives a lot of credit to video on your site if you put it in there the right way. Um, so those kinds of things are very important uh, when it comes to video. Um, other things we've seen in execution-wise, there's been a, a, a big preponderance of um, a lot of people now can make a really good-looking video very, very easily and very, very inexpensively. It is super easy to do that now. There are sites where you can plug in and make, uh, like, I don't know if you've heard of Animoto um, or Powtoons, or there's, there are tons of places where you can get amazing looking videos very, very inexpensively. Um, any kid now with, you know, kind parents can get a, a good DSLR for Christmas and shoot amazing looking uh, video. So those are the things that have changed. I think there's been a, I don't want to say a lowering of the bar, but I'd say certainly an, uh, an eased entrance into, into the industry. Um, and so yeah, there's a lot more of it. And we also know that, you know, as video continues to proliferate the internet, um, there's a lot more of it to see. The trick is just what's the content of that video? Um, I don't know if that answered your question, but okay. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Other thoughts? Yeah. Can you elaborate on that if you put it in there in the right way? I can. Do you want me to do that now or no? I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so putting it in there the right way, it depends on what you want to get the credit for, right? So a lot of people decide they think that YouTube is a, a great place to host a video because A, it's free, right? That's simple. Um, it's super easy to embed using YouTube codes. Like they, get, they make it, you have to be kind of a, not a very bright person to be able to not do it correctly, right? I mean, it's, it's super easy to do. Um, the problem is that since Google owns YouTube, Google wants to give the credit to YouTube and not to you. So if your video is on YouTube and you're using that to host it on your site, when, when someone searches for, and I'm sorry, what was it that you did again? Start publication. Oh, of course. Silly me. That was stupid, right? So they're, they're searching for a publisher, whatever it is, right? And so they find, here's all these, oh, look, there's all these sites that, you know, that are publishers, and then they find that there's videos about publishers. But unfortunately, if you've hosted it through YouTube, then it's going to direct them to the YouTube channel. It's not going to direct them to your website. So you have to put it in there in a different way. Um, there are different services you can use uh, to help you with that. Um, and it's, you know, without getting all long and complex and, and wordy about it, but, and I could give you the names of some of them, but kind of how you host it, the way that you embed it, and whether or not Google recognizes that there's a video from your sitemap, you know, when it goes to crawl and do all its nerdy things that it does, um, whether it knows that there's an actual video there or not makes a big difference. So you have to work with your, you know, your web developer to make sure it gets in there correctly. But. We can talk a little more about that uh, offline if that helps. <coughs> Other questions? Yeah. What are your thoughts about using humor? I hate humor. <laughs> I think funny is terrible. And you know, the reason I have, I, I was involved in putting a video together recently for, for our company, which is on a serious sub subject, sustainability. And what we did was we did some teamwork, which I thought really helped to engage the, the viewer and help make it fun and exciting. And Mm. So if they have a C at the front of their title, they probably lost humor a long time ago. They're just not fun people anymore. Uh, and so there may or may not be a way to do it, right? Um, huh? <laughs> exactly. Can I add? Yeah. So the, the best going to kind of segue in into mine, the best way to do that is to test and present the data. You know, like for sometimes if we have a client that is, you know, married to their website, we'll sign up for a, a user test.
test anonymous 10, 15 users and let them go through the site and let them tear it apart. Or the other option could be is that you've got the one with the humor and the one without, and you're experimenting. You're running the same video for half of your visitors, and you get to see which one drives the better result. Because a lot of times when you get to the C level, they like to uh, what's the they like to mark things and uh, and make sure that they've had their input. And it's an opinion. If you back it with data, all you can you can welcome all opinions and then test. So. Really quick, in the interest of, of I mean, that's 100% true, because usually at that level, you know, there's a lot of analytical guys and things like that, and they've got budgets and balance sheets and blah, 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 they have to pay attention to. So here's the truth, in the interest of truth telling, as a, I mean, a very micro, micro business, right? So it doesn't necessarily apply to big, big corporate, but I spend most of my day worrying about whether or not I'm making the right decision. And humor is risky, and it's scary and it may or may not get me in trouble. And so unless I have really good data to tell me one way or another, I'm gonna be very, very leery about that kind of a thing. I think that's probably the truth. Because all of you people depend on that guy to make sure whether or not the business continues to run. Fair? Tell him that. <laughs> He'll buy it. <laughs> yes? I was just gonna say that data point I work for a global research company. We've done a lot of normative data around humor and the effectiveness of it on advertising. And I can send you something after the fact that, that looks at that. Um, and, you know, it may not be specific to your particular industry, but we've done a lot of research on that. I can send it to you. Awesome. And it doesn't matter if it, it's totally relevant because you're a marketer. So just make it sound like it. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? I don't, yeah, Nathan. Touching on the concept of psychology and what people react to, somebody asked, well, what's the latest trend? I saw some of the, the whiteboard technique. That was a trend for a while where everybody's like, oh, we've got to do whiteboarding. And then I've seen some stats, and, and Vince will probably touch on this as well, that you see now people are reacting online more to vertical format, even though it drives us creatives crazy because we want to see horizontal and we go, hey, come on, it's got to be this way. But the hits that people are getting So I'm curious, as far as trends are concerned and the emotional response, are there techniques that you see that you're employing and going, hey, this is going to get us a longer run morality-wise right. and drive more hits, and maybe he can touch on that. And, and he may. Um, here's what I would say, and, and I don't, and again, love, respect, hugs, kisses, all those sorts of things. Um, not so much kisses. Wow. That was yeah, that was, that was a lot. Uh, <coughs> too, too emotional? Too emotional. Here, here's what, I, yes, there are trends, tons of them. Here's what I think. The best trend that you can have, and this is my personal opinion, the best trend you can have is watch what your competitors are doing and do the exact opposite all day, every day. There. That's your trend. Because whatever they choose to do is probably, most likely, what everybody else is choosing to do. Okay? So, yeah, maybe vertical, sure, for a while. And then when that's over, whatever. Whiteboard, maybe, eh, for a while. Whatever. Who cares? The point is, if you tell the truth and you tell it in the right order, it doesn't matter. It's not going to matter whether it's vertical or it's this way. Or that. That's, that's going to help drive it maybe for a little while or get you a little spike or a little peak or something like that. The best thing you can do is look at what your competitors are doing and do the opposite. I promise. All day, every day. Any other questions? All right. I have one more. You, yeah. Just one more. Um, production value. You know, uh, Overrated. Well, what the, the, there's a dichotomy that I've noticed is some folks will pay for high production but ignore the rest. And so, you know, is the, and that's sort of, it's a loaded question. Is there ever a time that production value could work against you? you know, like if you don't have professional actors, do you sure. have a professional script? And at what point? I think we should dump professional actors and professional scripts all together. Sorry, Nathan. <laughs> right? I mean, that's, in a lot of cases, it's just, it's toothbrush marketing, right? I mean, so there's value. The difference, right, if I pull up in a Ferrari, and I get out, and then you pop the hood and realize there's like a little, you know, like, like a gerbil or a little guy on a bike or something, you know, powering it, right? That's the difference. Production value is the Ferrari that pulls up. The content is that engine, right? That's the, that's the thing that moves it. So 